And with that, we'll kick it off for 15 DevOps Center tips for developers in just 20 minutes. Um, we will have a rerun of the session tomorrow, so if this, the space is too crowded, come tomorrow at 11.30 in the Yosemite Theater. And with that, it's us, Christian Sandor Knapp, my friend from Munich, a developer group leader in Munich and a Salesforce MVP Hall of Famer. And me, Daniel Stange, I'm a Salesforce MVP from the Frankfurt area and I lead the user group in Frankfurt. What we have for you today is a fast-paced journey around DevOps Center with 15 tips. And we start out with your role as a developer in a DevOps Center project. We'll talk about how to get started um, in a way that sets you up for success. Then we'll look into day-to-day -day business and good practices as a developer. And then Sandor will lift some secrets, let you look into things that are not documented, and he reverse engineered, looked under the hood into some features. But we'll keep that for later. First off, DevOps Center and you as a developer in a nutshell. You might know the situation in a project. There are many people involved, many different roles. There's you in the bottom. That's probably my friend Sandor, who works as a developer on the project with his old style in the IDE, with the command line, with very well versed in version control. He does his things and then puts it into version control. And then there's our friend Joe, our programmatic developer. And, um, she does the way she always does. She makes changes in a sandbox and then pushes them wherever, but not into version control. And this is a pain point that I, as the release manager on the right-hand side, always had for quite a while. Um, and what I did was educating declarative developers um, in using um, the version control tools, the command line. I explained Git to them for about seven years now. Um, and that was a steep learning curve for them. It all worked in the end, but it's still a task, right? And, whoops, sorry for that. And DevOps Center is here to solve that problem somehow for you. It is the replacement for change sets in a way, but it also allows declarative people to pull in their changes, same as developer does, in a nice and neat user interface. Um, and that brings together these two worlds and makes my life a bit easier when I do release management. So as a dev in a DevOps Center project, you simply do as you always do. You can go ahead, create a new uh, feature branch for your changes, then start doing your work, pulling in the changes that you did, make a commit, raise a pull request, and go home and have a drink. Your work's done, mine starts, um, and this is how it looks in DevOps Center. So the first thing that you might notice is the swim lanes. The swim lanes are the environments and also the stages in your development workflow. They represent an org and they represent a branch in your version control repo. And what Sandor just delivered to me is a work item that is complete and he asked me to promote it. Promotion is the term that DevOps Center chooses for bringing one change from one org to the other and also raise a pull request and merge it into the next branch. After you did that, DevOps Center offers you the uh, possibility to backsync the changes into the other orgs so that all the other developer orgs are in sync with the changes that you just made and that I just promoted. And I want to raise your attention to the blue boxes that I have on the, um, on the slide. These are bundles. This is another DevOps Center concept, which is comparable to a release. It combines many work items into one bundle that promotes all these changes, all these work items combined. You cannot separate them at this stage, and Sandor will talk about that in a few minutes. Now, the question is, what makes DevOps Center tick? And on the left-hand side, you see, obviously, by now and until now, our Salesforce orgs had no idea around repositories or version control systems. So DevOps Center brings, first of all, a data model that makes all this appear in your org. And what comes as no surprise, DevOps Center uses the same tools that we as developers use day by day. That means it uses ESF CLI, it uses the metadata API, and quite obvious, it somehow knows Git commands in order to uh, talk to GitHub. Now, who is doing the actual talking? 
If you look on the right hand side, then you see you have your DevOps Center org. And the DevOps Center org communicates in a command and control structure with a Heroku instance. And that Heroku instance is the instance which then does the actual deployments, which then does the actual talking to GitHub. And if this all sounds vaguely familiar for you, to you, this is probably because we as developers use those tools and this knowledge and this experience day by day by day. So while you are a developer on a project, you're also a very, very good candidate to become a release manager. And if you're not a release manager, then you're at least a perfect candidate to become release manager's best buddy because you know all the concepts around GitHub, mergers, pull requests. When you start out with DevOps Center, you start out very quickly because you enable it in your org, you install the package, and you're done. But then the actual questions arise. The first question will be, how many projects will I have in my DevOps Center installation? And our rule of thumb is one project, one org, one repo, which means that you have one destination org, one production org, and one repository there, and you have one project. Now, if you think about it, that is not the only way to have or set up projects. So if you really want to have several projects for one destination orgs, please make sure you use exactly the same stages in your distinct orgs and use distinct branch names so that the eventing does not get confused. What you also should do, especially if you're not using distinct branches, but the same branch names, QA, UAT, and staging, for example, that you should always backsync manually because DevOps Center currently has no knowledge about things that happen between projects. Now, if you take it one step further even, you might think, okay, I have an org, a dev org, and a staging org, and then I have like 20 production orgs, and I want to deploy my changes to all those 20 orgs. Well, if you want to do that, please consider packaging because that is not the use case of DevOps Center. Number four is don't ignore, force ignore. Now, this mnemonic is just for you to remember that at the end of the day, a Dev DevOps Center project is a Salesforce DX project. So you will need first, in the first few minutes of creating the project, think about if you want to change force ignore, for example, in order to filter out things that you don't want to deploy. Why is that important? Well, we get that to that a little later. You need to be aware that if you use the template repo from DevOps Center, a few things are already in ForceIgnore, for example, profiles, which is a good thing, but be aware that if you use the DevOps template, profiles will not be pulled. One of the other questions you will immediately ask yourself is probably, should I seed my repository? Should I put everything I have in my production org in my DevOps Center repository? And the answer to that is no. Oh. Or rather, please only seed what you really can deploy. And that actually means don't seed main. Start with a work item branch, start seeding there, and pull it over to your production org. You won't change anything, but you will make sure that you can deploy everything. Now, you could see it made, and you can use Work DevOps Center for a lot of time without issues. And then once of a sudden, you need to swap out one of the uh, orgs. So for example, your UAT sandbox is broken for whatever reason. Now you need to swap it. And if you do that, DevOps Center might be forced to deploy the whole repository. And it, if it does that, you might get into trouble. So full production Seeding is something for DevOps Center experts, and I want to reiterate, please only seed what you can make certain to be able to deploy. Bundle early, bundle often is a tip which comes from the product managers from DevOps Center, and while it takes a little bit of planning because you can't change a bundle's content once it's created, it's a great way to discipline to yourself into a structured release cycle. It also helps you to avoid too many merges, which puts a little bit of strain on DevOps Center, and will, it will also reduce the number of deployments that happen and how complicated those deployments are, because DevOps Center does some nice things we will cover a little bit later in the background. Now, let's take a step back and think about what it means in a day-to-day -day practice. DevOps Center brings some ideas, some proposals, some best practices about application lifecycle management and deploy a development workflow. 
And when I said in the beginning that you can do as a dev always do, I meant it in a way that you adhere to certain best practices and not develop the hacky way or do whatever you could do, because not everything that you could do is actually something that you should do. DevOps Center enforces some kind of discipline on us, uh, and I think that is very good. Let me give you two examples. Everything that you push through a DevOps Center pipeline starts on the left-hand side, starts with the work item that you work on, and then you promote it left to right. And once you started promoting, there's no excuse to promoting it left, uh, from left to right, and you cannot leave it behind, you cannot turn it back. Whenever you want to change something in a work item that you have already started to promote, you have to let it sit in the environment where it is. It's possible that you find mistakes, but then you have to start a new work item that fixes the problem that you found and bring it to the same stage where DevOps Center automatically offers you, since the latest release, to combine the work items, make that fix, and promote them together. You cannot change a work item that you started promoting in the first hand, okay? The next thing is, and it's closely related, once you started promoting something, there's no way turning back. You should, except with the hacky ways, which we don't want to do. So test and try out before you start. Um, if you have to change something before you start promoting, then you can never the work item, and um, you can revert to changes in Git, but when you started to promote, you have to go on promoting that or fixing it with another work item and combine that. Keep that in mind. No hacky hacks in DevOps Center pipelines. And this leads me to discipline. Discipline in adhering to a workflow, but also thinking about what kind of stages do you have, what kind of things you want to do in these stages, and the we want to invite you to remove all empty stages that have no purpose, no meaning from your pipeline. There's no thing like we have to have four stages. You have to define what each stage means. And then the discipline, the actual doing of things is the important thing. Here's an example for that. There's actions on each work item. And the one action that you uh, probably see is the review. What does it and it forces users to click and confirm that they did a review. And, but what does it mean? Start by defining what it means to do the review. Does it mean look into the pull request in GitHub? Does it mean look into the org? Does it mean to run a test plan or so? It's up to you to define it. But keep in mind, no empty clicks for your users in your pipeline. And this also goes for the toggle that you see in the bottom. That's the ready to promote toggle. What does it mean in your workflow to make an item ready to promote? Define that. Again, no empty clicks. One pain po or two pay points um, that you might incur uh, find. When you're in a release window, just as we are now, you always had the problem in the past with the way you did pro uh, projects that you might have used preview features and want to deploy to a non-preview org. DevOps Center, with the baseline of a DX project under the hood, has a fixed um, API version through the project manifest. And you can set the, this to the release, um, the release API version, and then you're more or less safe to not promote anything that's blocked to be deployed in, the, uh, in your target orgs. Once the release is done, or if you explicitly want it, raise the API version, and you're good to go. And as most of the things work asynchronously under the hood, there is a slight chance that things happen. We don't know what, but it happens from time to time that async communication fails, and then your work items, your commits, seem to be stored or blocking the pipeline. If that happens, you can run the SOCAL command that we have on the slide up here and fix the problem by manually setting the, um, the status of that async operation to the outcome that you can observe in, the, set, uh, in the, the object record that you see there. It's a pain point. It doesn't happen too often. But here's what you can do if this happens. Also, the product team is aware of the issue, and they're trying to fix it actively by now. Let's take the last few minutes to look behind the curtains of DevOps Center and deep dive a little bit into itsy bitsy bits, um, which are not yet in the documentation. 
So we talked about that previous sandboxes are now safe to use because the API version is a contract you have in your SFDX project JSON file. But what do you do if you want to use new features? Well, then you need to upgrade SFDX project JSON, but that's not all. Due to the fact that the metadata API is a huge construct, you need to be aware that there are unversioned metadata changes. And if you upgrade to a new Salesforce version from 58 to 59 maybe in the future, you must also, and I don't like the word must, but you must also uh, update your repository. And once again, don't pull all your org. Just pull the things that you have already in the repository. There is a DX command, uh, sorry, an SFCLI command <laughs> up there that you can use, uh, which will just update the components in your repository, do a commit, and you're done by retrieving um, everything via the SFCLI. Goodbye set about it trail. If you are a fan of governance like I am, because governance means I can sleep well at night, then uh, you will be happy that DevOps Center locks and reports everything. So you can report down on which metadata component was changed during a commit. And this is amazing. And it takes a little bit up of your data space. But the team is aware as well and is working on that. Now, what I like very much about DevOps Center is that I don't have only one automation now, layer now, I have two automation layers. First of all, I have the platform automation layer. I can create an alert via flow and the data model to tell me every time a profile has changed or a specific profile has changed, like the admin profile. This is good because it gives me once again the safety that nothing changes without me noticing. Now, the second layer of Automation is GitHub Actions, and we can't go into details about GitHub Actions here, but if you want to do test deployments, if you want to do end-to-end -end testing with browser automation tests, then GitHub Actions is your friend there. And what's even greater and better than GitHub Actions alone is GitHub Actions plus DevOps Center, because with the release last week of version 6.0, there is now CLI commands that allow you to harmonize GitHub Actions and DevOps Center. So you can do a lot of automated checks with PMD and all the node tooling there is in the world, and only if those checks turn green, then there will be an automatic promotion to the next stage. Now, to all the DevOps experts in our audience there, please be aware that the deployment still happens via Heroku. So if you're thinking about metadata transformations and something similar, we are not there yet. If you are very, very curious about the details and how it works with GitHub Actions, then we will give you a demo repository link in the resources file. But before that, we will go deep into the heart of DevOps Center and look at a certain kind of record, which is the async operation result. As you remember, we have Heroku somewhere, and Heroku is actually executing commands on our behalf. And the async operation result will tell you exactly which commands have been issued. So if something fails, you can look at the async operation result, and if you're a little bit knowledgeable in Git and SF commands, you will find out what Heroku is trying to do, and also find out why it doesn't work, for example. And this is really, really great, because it's completely transparent what DevOps Center does, and if you're curious, DevOps Center currently knows about seven different async operations. My favorite one is the soup promote, and if you want to know more about that, please talk to me after the session. We promised you a demo repository, and you can find it on our resources slide here, and um, you also find uh, documentation, the user group, and what's, what's really important, you find the public roadmap. DevOps Center is one of the very few Salesforce products that has a public roadmap. And to let you leave into your afternoon with a very, very great message, yes, Bitbucket and other VCS integrations have been announced to Streamforce and should be, should be rolled out soonishly. Thank you so much for your time. Enjoy your Dreamforce, and please try out DevOps Center. <laughs>